Most people have an anchor of fear that keeps them grounded to a place or a path of comfort for the majority of their lives. But there are those who don't have an anchor, but rather a fire of passion that pushes them to feed their thirst for adventure and to live to their fullest potential, to carve a path that no one has carved before. What if I told you I knew of a man who did just that, who if he died today, he would say he lived life to his fullest potential, a life of adventure he created and carved out of passion. That man is Fen, and this is his story. If somebody would have told me 25 years ago that I'd be sitting at this table like this in my own little log house on top of a hill, I would have said, my God, that is exactly how I would envision my life. I was in Switzerland and I was not happy with my life. Um, I was content, but I, I was not, I was not totally fulfilled. And I knew that I had to change things around to live to my maximum potential in life. And um, I was always interested in dog mushing, um, reading books when I was seven years old, hearing stories about the bears and the moose and the, the wilderness and the adventures to be had in this big state. And um, I just wanted to come and check it out get a feel for what mushing is all about. I came in 2001, October 18th, I never forget that day, and I arrived in Anchorage um, to become a dog handler for a racing kennel. So I was a dog handler, living the dog mushing lifestyle, being a, a dirtbag dog musher, so to speak, just living the life, not caring about money, but just being able to spend every day and every minute with sled dogs, training them, running them through this beautiful country that I now can call my home. And um, I fell in love. I fell absolutely in love for the first minute that I stepped into a professional dog kennel. That kennel had 80 some dogs and um, we worked long hours into the nights, cutting meat, preparing. This is a lifestyle that is very physical demanding. It um, requires a lot of hours outside and um, requires a lot of hours um, uh, preparing the food, making sure the dogs are taken care of. Um, so it's a very physical demanding entity, but I loved it. It was right down my alley and I had to go back to Switzerland due to visa reasons and um, came back another winter to the same kennel and then decided to stay. Luckily, I met my um, now ex-wife and I started my own operation. That was called Willow Creek Kennel. And we bred puppies with the goal to one day run the Adidrat. Um, I got a job with the state as a wildland firefighter hotshot with Pioneer Peak hotshots and met amazing men. Uh, on that 20 person shot crew and so could sustain my lifestyle of making money in the summertime fighting fires all over Alaska at the low 48 and then I could spend it all on dogs um, so that I had zero again in April so I could start all up again and make money for the dogs in the winter and I loved the lifestyle it was a really good fun time and then we had the goal to run the Adidas ride in 2008. Um, a lot of people always say that the Adidas ride must be really difficult to which I say, the Adidorat sure is a is an obstacle that you gotta tackle, and it's not easy at times. But to get to the starting line, I think is a lot more a lot more difficult. To get your finances in order, to get uh, the dogs healthy to the starting line, to make sure you train aggressively but yet conservative to conserve these guys' fitness level and health. Um, so in 2008, we were at the starting line of my first Adidorat, the rookie year. And um, it was 105 people participated that year. And we finished 36th. Then 2009 rolled around. We could improve a little bit. Um, we were 22nd place. 2010 rolled around. We were 17th. 2011 rolled around. We were 14th. So we had improvements every year. Um, but then I ran out of financial resources. It's so expensive to run it. And I went through a divorce that during that time. So I was not in a good financial position to continue this crazy passion. 
and I was almost, almost at the point where I was getting rid of the dogs, where I almost sold them all. But I was like, you know, let's try this tourism thing before we all give up. And I went up to a village uh, by the name of Bettles and provided sled dog trips out in Bettles, 35 miles north of the Arctic Circle for the Bettles Lodge. And then moved down to Fairbanks where we had a little bit more access to um, higher numbers of people to come and visit. And that's where we're at. Dog mushing is an incredible, uh, it's a incredible, beautiful sport with dogs that you bred and held in your hand when they are through two weeks old or two days old actually and then they get to be two years old and you're running them through these hills and you feel like you're standing behind an Alaska railroad just rolling through these this country it connects me really with the nature because you don't have an engine you don't have a snow machine that relies on combustion it's just really peaceful it's really peaceful you leave your cell phone behind you leave your emails behind you leave your worries behind and it gets you a little bit away from this fast-paced living where we all depend on technology so it's a really it's a really peaceful a peaceful way but it's also a performance like it's also i mean we are when we train for a diderot it's very structured we know what i want to get out of a run it's planned i also not only the moments that I enjoy the northern lights and the beauty of the land, um, of course, they're always there. But when you train for a Diderot, you look at the gate, you look at how they're reacting to different length of the trail runs. How do they do after certain stops for two, three hours? It becomes a very structural, thought out plan of running where after a while you do this, like two, three years in, you become more like an analyst. You analyze the dogs more than you enjoy the black spruce that you see a million off or the trails that you go over and over and over and over um so yeah it becomes more of a scientific project sometimes than um other than just a run in the beautiful nature and especially if you train at night um then it really you don't really see what's going on you are almost a little bit tunnel vision i enjoy nature now with the dogs a lot more because i don't train for a diderot no more my runs are a lot more seldom I have my crew that runs um, my business pretty much. I just manage it, but they do the dog tours. And so when I go out now, I enjoy it a lot more than I used to when I ran a Diderot because I was so tuned into the dogs that sometimes I had the blinders on like a horse going down the trail where you just look and how they move. I have my own sled dog business. It's amazing. I don't have any mental battles anymore. Like I found the life that I wanted to live so then I was mentally battling in Switzerland. I battled over there with the life that I had to be at the office at eight o'clock in the morning and I could go home at five and do it five times a week and then have weekends. That for me was a mental battle. So the mental battles for me are not there um, because I have overcome those in order to come to Alaska. Those were, that was not hard. I mean, you know, uh, sometimes always I, I sometimes see these people that take the safe route in life. And that usually doesn't get you to when you want to pursue your dream. It was hard to get all this. Blood, sweat and tears was really in this. I mean, it was tif difficult to build everything. And, and those were the mental battles. But then once I had everything the way it was, then it was beautiful. I just want to make sure that I live to the fullest while I'm on this planet. And that I live every minute to the fullest. And that I can do every day what I, what I love to do until I'm gone. The fire of your soul will either consume you or bring you warmth in life, but you need to decide what you're going to allow it to do. But I hope, my hope for you is that you will glow and burn with passion to live, to go and see the beauty of the world. My name is Sven Haltman and this is my story.